continue to support for the Southside Church, and we want to share God's word, share like faith, be encouraged to be better stewards and ambassadors of Jesus to Christ. It is an exhilarating time to be a member of the Southside Church of Christ. Uh, we have exciting plans for this year. We're here to pray for those amongst us and that are with us inside the family at Southside, particularly those who are just going through the going through, whether it's loss of loved ones, maybe it's loss of property, a person, maybe it's just depression. But many of our members have suffered uh, from maladies and from personal tragedies. And we invoke the prayers of the righteous that God would avail much with those 
who are impaired. Tonight, beloved, one of the things we shared a couple of weeks ago uh, in our congregational meeting is the expansion of leadership <clears throat> at the Southside Church of Christ. And as we now segue and as we transition to some more new leaders, we're going to keep all of our current leaders in place, all of our elders and deacons that are in place will remain in place. We're talking about expansion and with much prayer and supplication and consultation with God, as we expand the borders of the kingdom at the Southside Church of Christ, God has led me to uh, nominate uh, Deacon Elect Tracy McDuffie, beautiful wife, Janelle and family. Uh, Tracy is doing a phenomenal job already in the capacity of the work it would take to be a deacon. He's certainly uh, proven himself to be deacon material, works very cohesively uh, with our IT team led by Deacon Isaac Peterson, but he, he does a phenomenal job. Very proud of him uh, and his family. Uh, so Tracy McDuffie has been nominated to be a deacon uh, for the Southside Church. And in the area of shepherd, elder bishop, uh, none other than Reginald Philip Moses, and you know his lovely, beautiful wife, Ursula, uh, beautiful family, uh, great servants of the Southside Church and the Lord's Church for a number of years. He's been serving as a deacon at the church for a number of years. Now, I kind of like uh, the secession from deacon uh, to elder. Uh, those individuals have already been vetted by me and the church, so we kind of know what we're getting, but Reggie has proven to be shepherd, elder, bishop, materi material. His care, concern, his ability to teach, his ability to relate to the member, he's a shepherd who would definitely smell like sheep. And so be praying for Reggie uh, Moses, who's elder elect, and Tracy McDuffie, who's deacon elect, that the process will be smooth. Our target date is uh, homecoming 2024 for ordination. That's our target date. It give me some flexibility with that. Uh, I want to take some time to teach the church and some time to train them about the role, the enormous role, the gravity of the role they're about to undertake and the responsibility of the church as we uh, ordain and sanction them as leaders of the God's people at Southside. Um, tonight we'll begin some of that teaching and we'll be doing sporadic, periodic teaching all the year long <clears throat> about qualities and traits and characteristics for those who will lead us. Tonight, let's use an Old Testament example. Now, there's Old Testament leadership, and of course, you know, New Testament leadership uh, within the Church of Christ. We will uh, examine both and extract from the scriptures leadership qualities and characteristics and traits and tenets and concepts and precepts that would be helpful to these men and their families and to the church as we work cohesively together for the building of the kingdom. Let's trace tonight and use as a template an example of leadership, godly leadership, spiritual leadership, biblical leadership. That's the only kind of leadership I'm concerned with. We don't want political leadership, particularly in the vein that we see in our country today. We, we don't want that. We want biblical, scriptural, um, scriptural leadership. And one of those people in the Old Testament that seems to be a, a great example would be Joshua. If you remember, if you trace his life, if you examine his resume, his credentials, his qualifications, you'll see he possessed uh, many, if not all, the things that a man should possess as a leader of God's people. Joshua succeeded Moses. He was second lieutenant to Moses. He was Moses' assistant. It's hard to lead people if you had never helped the leader before you become a leader. Uh, Joshua was there at the Red Sea when Moses parted uh, the water. 
but he succeeded Moses, and it was later Joshua, who was at Georgia River, who forged Jordan. He saw water being parted at the Red Sea. He parted the water himself at Jordan River. Many exploits and great works did Joshua do as a leader that would lead me tonight to use him as our example, template to put under the crucible of investigation, beloved. Not only did he forge uh, Jordan River, not only was he there when Moses parted the Red Sea, it was Joshua who led a seven-day marathon around the walls of Jericho, and they came up tumbling down. It was Joshua who stood one day in the valley and called upon God in the time of war with the Hebrewsites. He said uh, to God, and God prayed, and, uh, he prayed, and God answered his prayer. And that day in the valley, the sun and the moon stood still. So Joshua was there with God. God was with Joshua. Let's examine tonight a few things. I believe that a leadership qualities that we should look for and prayerfully find in the men who will lead us, <clears throat> even in the New Testament. The qualities and qualifications have not changed for what it takes to be a leader amongst God's people. In Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, we find out uh, Joshua was faithfully uh, called to obey God. Moses had died. Uh, God then said Israel could mourn for 30 days and then God uh, passed the mantle of leadership on to Joshua. Uh, he became a role model, uh, an example as Moses was for the kind of person God wanted to lead his people. Let's tonight look on the five quick umbrellas, I think, we can benefit from under the qualities of leadership, our leadership qualities. The first thing, as Joshua was, and all men today, Macduffy is, as well as Reginald Moses, you ought to be a man of humility. A man of humility becomes a good leader. Before you can lead people, you need to learn how to serve people. A uh, poor example of leadership is when leaders think they're there to be served. Leaders ought to be respected and leaders ought to be appreciated. But leaders are there to serve. It is the wrong modus operandi when a man thinks he's nominated or ordained a sanction so people can galvanize to serve him. No, leaders are out front taking the risk. Uh, leaders are out front being the example. Leaders are out front to take bullets for the flock. The flock should always value, appreciate, laud, applaud their leaders. Respect your leaders. But leaders' primary role is to serve the people. He's a man of humility. You don't mind getting down and dirty and rolling your sleeve up. Poor leader that wants everybody to serve him. No, leaders are men of humility. And before you can lead, you need to learn how to serve. This is Joshua spent 40 years in servitude under Moses in the wilderness. He was trained by the best. So subsequently, he became the best. He was second lieutenant. He was uh, general of the Hebrew army for 40 years with Moses before he ascended to top dog. So he served most of his life, not led most of his life. Your number one trait to be a leader, biblically, is to have be a man of humility. Yes, he was known as Moses' assistant for 40 years according to Exodus 24, verse 13. Great leaders have no problem serving other people. 
It is superficial and pseudo leaders who want to be served by people instead of serving other people. And even when you become a leader after you spent time in servitude, you still become a servant. According to Mark chapter 10, verse 35, Jesus taught his disciples that he who is great amongst us shall be your servant, or be your minister. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served. He said, I the son of man came to serve. Yes, it's a great trait, characteristic. Ought to be stamped on your passport and your resume that a leader is a man of humility. Second, a leader ought to be a man of faith. He must trust and believe in God. He's a man of faith. That was demonstrated by Joshua in the Old Testament. You remember Moses was called by God to uh, select 12 spies to go do a reconnaissance mission in the promised land of Canaan. There were 12 tribes and God told Moses to select one leader from every tribe to be despised. God is equitable. God wanted some diversity. He said, "Not nah, don't get three people from one tribe. Every tribe ought to be represented in this inquiry into the promised land. Joshua was one of the 12 chosen. And to prove he was a man of faith and trusted in God, according to Numbers 13th chapter, verses 25 and through 28, 10 of the spies out of 12, 10, the majority, 10 out of 12 came back with a negative report. Yes, Moses, you are right. Promised land is flowing with milk and honey. Yes, Moses, you are right. The weather is 72 degrees year round. Yes, Moses, you are right. There's pomegranates and grapes and melons everywhere. Yes, Moses, you are right. It's a beautiful land. It's a wonderful land. Milk and honey everywhere. But Moses, you didn't tell us that there are giants there. And subsequently, since they're the sons of Anak, we cannot take the land. But two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, according to Numbers 14, verses 6 through 9, Joshua and Caleb came back with a positive report. They contrast what the majority said. This is the minority report. That's why you will never get caught up all the time with who's got the most and how many followers. And that doesn't work. Might does not make right. Joshua and Caleb said, yes, they, they, they're right, Moses. Big old tall men, giants there. But we can take the land. My brother said, let's go now and take the land. They trusted God. They had faith and confidence in God. If you're going to lead people, you got to be a man of faith. Not only a man of humility, a servant, but you got to trust God even when you can't trace God. Yes, that was also demonstrated by Joshua at the fall of the wall in Jericho. He took instruction from God that they should walk around the wall once a day for seven days. And on the seventh day, walk around seven times. He had to believe that. What a silly way. You mean you don't have any military strategy, Joshua? You don't have any military training, Joshua? You don't have a demolition crew, any bulldozers to knock that wall down? No, Joshua, all I got is God's word. They marched around for seven days and on the seventh day, seven times, blew the trumpet and the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. I said, is it? that's according to Joshua, the sixth chapter, verses one through five. I was blessed to see the walls of Jericho when I was in Jerusalem. It'll change your life when you go to the Holy Land. It's always something you'll see that you read in the Bible that brings it to life. And so he's a man of humility, and all leaders ought to be men of humility, and then Joshua is a man of faith. Yes, you know what else? He's a man of God's word. Now again, we're just talking about leadership qualities. In the church, really, this works in the church and the home. These are just basic leadership qualities. Yes, his success as a leader was directly related to his adherence to God's word. 
He followed God's word without any deviation to the right or to the left. He trusted God. He's a man of faith. And he followed the spiritual GPS, the road map that God left, according to Joshua chapter 1, verses 7 through 8. He followed God's word to the T, dotted every I crossed every T. Because to be a leader amongst God people, you got to be a man of God's word. You got to know the word, and you got to be willing to follow the word. Some men are poor leaders because they don't know what God says. Some men are poor leaders because they know what he said, but they won't follow what it says. Joshua then and leaders now have to be men who both know the word and follow the word of God. Joshua led the tribes of Israel after Moses' death. Joshua reminded them of the covenant God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even to the end of his life, God, Joshua encouraged them to heed the word of God. So yes, yes, a thousand times yes. Joshua was a man of humility. That's what you need today. Joshua is a man of faith. That's what you need today. Joshua is a man of God's word. Essential today. Fourthly, beloved, he's a man of prayer. You cannot lead people and you don't have a strong, vibrant prayer life. It is absolutely vital and essential to lead that the man leading or the men, the group of men leading, be strong prayer warriors. Don't ever select and ordain people who are not strong prayer warriors. If they don't have a strong prayer life themselves, surely they won't make intercession for you. No, you need to be a man of prayer to be a leader. Yes, prayer is our 20 megaton bomb in the arsenal of the Christian. Prayer is that weapon in our toolbox that confounds Satan. Prayer changes things. Prayer moves God. Prayers can alter the trajectory of a church and the lives of the members. Yes, folks, to be a leader, whether it's an elder, a deacon, and certainly to be a preacher, you got to be a man of prayer. Joshua was praying not only for the success of Israel, he was found praying about the failures of Israel. According to Joshua chapter 7, verses 6 through 9, after the defeat of Ai, Joshua beseeched God on behalf of the people. Ai was a, a hard battle for, for Israel. And you got to remember <clears throat> but, uh, that leaders pray when things are well. They pray when things are not so well. Leaders have to be out front with prayer, not behind in prayer. Leaders <clears throat> have to uh, pray when the church is running well and pray when the church seemingly is on a trajectory of failure. Yes, you have to be a man of humility. We're talking about leadership qualities tonight. Leaders are men of humility. Secondly, men, leaders are men of faith. Thirdly, leaders are men of God's word. Fourthly, fourthly they are men of prayer. Yes, publicly, public prayer and private prayer. When I mean a strong prayer warrior, I'm not talking about the eloquence of the words and the superfluity of speech. I'm talking about a strong prayer life that is brought by evidence that they can move heaven and move earth when they go before the majestic throne of God. A leader knows how to bombard the throne of God and make intercession for the people. You don't want to marry a man, sister, who's not a strong prayer wife, prayer warrior. Yes, you see, uh, leadership, the man ordained sanctioned by God, the leader in the home and in the church. And these are the traits, the qualities that he ought to possess if he's going to be an effective, useful, beneficial leader. And then lastly tonight, not only is a man a leader, the qualities that leaders ought to possess, not only is he a man of, of humility, not only is he a man of faith, 
Not only is he a man of God's word, not only is he a man of prayer, he's a man that always puts God first. God is uno in his life, and he demands that God be first in the lives of the people that he leads. Yes, you need a God first leader, not a self first leader. Uh, we'll talk next week about leadership qualities of elders in the New Testament. And one of the things you'll find that he cannot be seeking filthy lucre or monetary gain. When a leader puts himself first, and we see that in our body of politics, whether they're Democrats or Republicans or independents, whether it's state level, local level, whether it's federal level, national level, politicians tend to put themselves first, pad their own pocket. And godly men, leaders in the kingdom, never put themselves first. Matter of fact, sacrificial men, you know this, husbands and you wives that are blessed to have a great husband. A husband, a leader, a father will sacrifice himself for the good of his wife and children. And that's what a leader would do in church. He will uh, he would sacrifice what's good for him for the good of the kingdom. I, I, you know, I see churches that are dying and now some on the respirator about ready to die because the leadership can't transition. They, they want to keep it the way they want it. They're not comfortable with progress or progression. And so they want to kill the church thing, grow the church, because they put their feelings first instead of the word of God first. And that's a tragedy. I'm, one of the reasons that I'm ordaining and sanctioning these gentlemen now is for the long view of the church, the longevity of the South Side Church of Christ. <clears throat> I want the church to be strong and vibrant after my departure, after my administration is gone. I do not want that to be the end of the success of our congregation. And so these very educated submissive, humble, hard-working, visionary prayer warriors that we are naming is for the good of the church, even after myself, David, and Carmen have gone. We want the church to function effectively in perpetuity. And so leaders always put God first, evidenced by Joshua in Joshua chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. And of course, who can forget arguably the most uh, known scripture related to Joshua, Joshua 24, 15, when he states, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about what God wants. So Joshua said, when I speak, I'm the leader here. When I speak, Joshua said, I speak for sister Joshua. I speak for Joshua Jr. and Joshua Netta. As for me and my house, Joshua said, we will serve the Lord. Yes, yes, a thousand times, yes. These are the leadership qualities then in the Old Testament and leadership qualities now that men must possess if they're going to be out front and call themselves leaders of God's people. It must be men of humility, men of faith, men of God's word, Men of prayer and men who always put God first. Shall we pray? God, we're mindful, glad, happy, thankful that Southside Church transitioning more leaders to lead the flock and the body of our congregation. Pray for your wisdom, your guidance in this process. I pray that I can do effective teaching to prepare the church and effective training to prepare the men that we have a smooth uh, process without hitch or glitch for the good of the kingdom. Not only we pray for these men, but their wives, their families. We pray for the church. We pray for impaired people everywhere. We pray for other congregations who can find, sanction, and train men to lead the body of Christ. So guide us, lead us, protect us, forgive us for we disappoint you. Give us the fortitude to forgive one another. As you, for Christ's sake, have forgiven us. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
But now, join us this Sunday. It's the last Sunday of January. It's the fifth Sunday in January. We encourage all of our members to invite an online uh, buddy, a partner, a friend to either watch the service or to just be there. We're encouraging you, you and especially you. Come back to the sanctuary. We have pretty good crowd Sunday. We want that to continue to increase. I thought we're guessing, I think we're back up to about 70% of the capacity we used to have. And we want to get that percentage higher. We're having a grand time of worshiping and praising God. You can join us every Sunday at 10 a.m. Sunday school classes for all ages, new converse class for those who uh, need second teaching. And then 11 a.m. morning worship every Sunday beginning properly at 11 a.m. For those who can't attend, we want you to attend, but if you can't, we live stream on all of our social media outlets. And then, of course, every Wednesday night at 7 p.m., you can join us here on this outlet. And we study God's Word together on a wonderful Wednesday in the Word. Good night. God bless you. This is our prayer. Hopefully, I'll see you on Sunday. Good night.